Hi, everybody. Welcome to week two of The Spiritual Life. Our theme this week is religious spiritualities. So by that, I mean spiritual traditions that are embedded, as it were, within uh, religious traditions. So we'll talk a little bit about that notion of, of tradition in a minute. Your readings for this week include selections from a book by Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest and spiritual writer, about whom we'll say a good bit more here, and uh, a book about the Sufi tradition called Outlines of An Outline of Sufism, I think it is, by a fellow named Stoddart. Uh, and that helpfully maps out the specific features of Sufi Islam. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about the more general features of that tradition so you can get some of your bearings. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive in. So you'll see two images here. <clears throat> um, the first one pertains to, to Rohr's reading. It's called uh, The Labyrinth. Uh, it's a form of Christian practice that's been around for a number of centuries and is relevant to what he says in that text. Uh, and the second one is an image of uh, someone dancing in the traditional uh, manner of the Sufis. And we'll say a bit more about that as well. But uh, let's get into the the content here. Now, as I said, we're talking about two different traditions. Um, I think this word tradition requires a little bit of comment. Uh, number one, often we think of tradition as something that is fixed, firm, cannot be changed. Basically a list of true things. Uh, if you deviate from them, uh, there, are, there are consequences, uh, social or, or moral or otherwise. I would encourage us to consider a different definition of tradition. I mean of tradition as what I'll call a space of contestation. A space of contestation. What do I mean by that? Think about a, a boxing ring or a baseball game, any kind of sport, right? There are certain features of that activity that are fixed. Uh, in the case of baseball, you have four bases, including home plate. In the, in the case of boxing, you have a ring. You have certain things that can and cannot be done. Referees are there to ensure that folks remain within those defined bounds. However, everything that happens within that uh, def those definitions, right, within those um, features that make the game what it is, is spontaneous and original and remarkable uh, very often when the game is played by highly talented individuals. Um, often uh, what happens on the field can lead to changes even in the structure of the game, right? And we've seen that in various sports over the years as new things have emerged in, in the space of, of, those, of those activities. So a tradition in a way is, is similar to this. Uh, it's not something that, you know, every feature is just listed out. It's a space in which there are certain kind of broad things that are, that are at least provisionally accepted, you know. And then within the space of having accepted those, people debate, right? What does this mean for today? How should this be interpreted today? Things like that. So um, with that broader notion of tradition, I think we can go on to the second feature uh, of that term that I want to highlight for you. So the first was that it's not simply a fixed list of things, but as I put it, a space of contestation. The second is that you can think of traditions as one embedded within the other. So there is a broad tradition, let's call it Christianity, taking the first example here on the left of Rohr's book. Richard Rohr is a Christian, you would say, in a sociological sense. He identifies as a Christian. He was engaged with the Christian tradition. He venerates the person of Jesus Christ in, in original ways. Um, but he's also participating in what you would call the, the tradition of contemplative prayer or the contemplative tradition within Christianity. Um, and even within that tradition, there are different modes or forms of it. So Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, had a certain understanding of contemplation. Dominic Gutzmann, the founder of the Dominican order uh, that founded this college, had his own understanding 
of contemplation. Aristotle, outside of Christianity, has a different understanding of contemplation. There is what we can call a family resemblance. You remember that term from last week between these different traditions. Um, but each one is unique in itself and kind of nested within larger traditions. Um, so when you're studying religion, one thing to look at is the, the, the structure of the relationships between these different streams of belief and practice underneath what we call, you know, the five world religions or, or, or whatever it is. Um, that's the, the most 30,000 foot level of, of detail um, in order to understand anything about the actual practice of the traditions. You have to move uh, down to more specific. So on the left here, we have the cover of what you're reading uh, from Richard Rohr, Everything Belongs, The Gift of Contemplative Prayer. Uh, and this is representing the Christian tradition most broadly. Uh, on the right, you have Outline of Sufism, The Essentials of Islamic Spirituality by William Stoddard. And that's uh, different from Rohr's in the sense that Stoddard is writing as a scholar, we would say. He's an objective commentator on the philosophy and, and teachings of Sufism, uh, whereas Rohr is himself a Franciscan priest and very much within the tradition. He's speaking from the perspective of someone um, committed in that way. So let's take a look at each of these two, see what we can make of it. So back to the labyrinth, friends. We started with this image on the first slide. Let's say a little bit more about it. This image of the labyrinth is, is quite old. It's from uh, the floor of a medieval cathedral, I believe, in France. And there are several things you can notice about this labyrinth. One is that there are no dead ends. And I invite you to enlarge the slide and take a look. Uh, there are no dead ends. If you get on the path and stay on the path, you will reach the center. That is, you will move from the periphery to the center. Uh, also, uh, it's hard to tell when you're walking this labyrinth at any moment where you are and how far you have left to go. Uh, it's kind of mysterious. You can, you know, be very close to the center and then uh, five minutes later you're way out on the periphery again, right? And unless you have the overall picture as we do here from above, you can't really tell how much progress you're making. Traditionally, within Christianity, this is taken as an image of the spiritual life that God uh, has for each of us, and also the term providence is used for, for the whole of God's creation, the whole of the world, a certain plan or intention, right? And each of us is walking that path, although we can't see the full meaning of it. However, each of us will ultimately reach the center. This is the ultimate optimism of, of Christianity, or we should probably say the hope, um, hope being one of the defining virtues of the tradition. I think I disappeared there for a minute, but I'm back. Now, on this next slide, we see Richard Rohr himself. So Richard Rohr has, for half a century, been a prominent spiritual teacher, uh, he is a priest in the Franciscan tradition, so that's the order founded by St. Francis of Assisi uh, back in the 13th century. Um, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, as we mentioned last time, are both orders that practice this kind of ascetic, um, ascetic commitment in a certain way. So, so they, they live in community, they deny themselves kind of certain comforts or ownership of property in some cases, um, but they're also very much engaged with uh, connecting with people outside of that community, right, and spreading the message that animates their own life. Uh, Richard Rohr um, is in many ways controversial within the Catholic space uh, because he is calling upon Catholic Christians to think in new ways about their tradition. So if, again, you think of a tradition as a space of contestation, one of the significant contestants of our day is Richard Rohr. So let's say a bit about the book in general, and then I'll have a comment briefly on each of the three chapters that, that you were assigned from it. In this book, uh, which is not, I mean, Rohr has published dozens of books. This is simply one of them. Um, Rohr draws on the whole sweep of the Christian spiritual tradition and mystical 
traditions. Remember, we had that word mysticism last week. What he wants to do is address people in their real practical lives. And that's one reason why I chose this book to share with you, uh, because it is so focused on personal experience and on daily practice. Um, he's known for giving new meaning to old Christian ideas. And I have an example up here on the slide. I think this is a good way of, see, of, of understanding what it means to work within a tradition. Right? So at the Easter Vigil, tra traditionally <laughs> in the Catholic Mass that's celebrated on the night before Easter, so that's called a Vigil Mass if it's celebrated the day before uh, what it commemorates, um, the deacon, as part of the liturgy, liturgy is the word that is used for what happens at Mass, um, says uh, the words Felix culpa. Um, he's referring there to Adam and Eve, so the story in Genesis chapter 2 of the fall, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the snake that tempts Eve, and so forth. You'll be familiar with that story. In a way, that is a culpa. It is a fault, right? So we get the word culpability for that. If you're in a car accident, you might say, am I culpable? That means, do I have to have my insurance pay for it? Um, so uh, Felix, however, means happy. It's a strange combination of terms, uh, as much in Latin as it is in English. Um, usually something that's your fault isn't something that you'd be happy about. What the deacon means at that Easter Vigil liturgy uh, is that the culpa, the fault committed by Adam and Eve that set humankind apart from God uh, has been healed, closed, resolved through the life, death, and, um, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the Christian point of view. And so how glorious is that event of the death and resurrection of, of Christ um, it makes the culpa, the original fault that made it necessary, seem almost happy because we can be grateful for such a, a wonderful outcome. Now, usually um, this word culpa, as I've been using it, is rendered a fault, right? So you are guilty, as in our example, you're culpable. What Rohr does at one point near the beginning of his text, and you might notice this or you might not have because he doesn't make a big deal out of it, he simply translates Felix culpa as a happy mistake, as a happy mistake. What's the difference, you'd say, right? Okay, well, let's think about it. What's a fault and what's a mistake? Well, fault means that I'm liable, I'm culpable. It's my fault, right? I am guilty. And that is traditionally how the notion of the original sin has been understood within Christianity, not just Catholicism. Uh, and uh, so what is he doing with that? Well, he's pointing out that the word culpa in Latin does not suggest an intentional action for which one is guilty. Um, it could be a mistake. Uh, both of those, fault and mistake, uh, can translate the Latin word culpa. So what Rohr is doing is moving away from the focus on guilt and blame and sin even, right? And f moving toward a very realistic notion that each of us, quite despite what our intentions might be in a given case, uh, make mistakes and do things wrong and do things that we have just cause to regret. Um, I don't know why I'm disappearing, I will continue. Um, and so this is an example of how working with a traditional notion of Christianity, the Felix culpa, he shifts it in a new direction to make it more relevant and, um, and uh, attractive, we can say, to people today. Now here we have a quotation from Alan of Lille, uh, which is not explicitly quoted by Rohr, but which I think might be in his mind as, a, as an underlying reason for the whole book. Uh, it's from, um, as we said, Alan of Lille. He was also a Franciscan, just like Rohr. Um, and it's quoted by St. Bonaventure, who, another Franciscan who was a very important thinker in history. The quotation is this, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. That's something to think about. What does it mean? 
Well, on the one hand, he's not saying that there is no center or circumference with, with respect to God, that those notions continue to hold. However, um, there is no place on earth or in our lives that is the center and other places are merely the circumference, the periphery, not so important, right? For Alan of Lil, uh, everywhere we are is the center with respect to God. Uh, and so God can be found, as Rohr emphasizes throughout his reading, in, in all things. I want to comment on the epigraph. Uh, epigraph is the, the word used for a little quote placed at the beginning of a paper. Uh, at the start of the first chapter of um, Rohr's book, uh, it's a, a passage here from a poem by William Butler Yeats. The poem is The Second Coming, uh, and it reads as follows. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Let's think a bit about that. I think the meaning might not be immediately apparent. First of all, the title of the poem is The Second Coming. So Yeats is describing the circumstances that precede the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So he's writing here about the Christian belief that Jesus Christ will return uh, at the end of time or the time of the judgment. Um, all of these images are used. He's uh, trying to characterize what things look like just before, in this Christian case, Christ intervenes before he comes again. So we have here a widening gyre. Gyre is like a whirlwind, right, or a storm. Something very confused. Everything fall, flying all about. You know, lawn chairs and uh, plants and trees coming down and everything else, right? So what is turning in this widening or ever increasing storm? The falcon. The falcon is lost. The falcon is flying around, and he's looking for the falconer. Right? Now, a falcon is a bird, and a falconer, as you know, is, uh, how do I do it in this thing, you know, might have something on, on his or her arm, and then the falcon lands on that arm and, and takes off from it. That's the relation of a falconer to a, to a falcon. So if the falcon has left from the arm of the falconer, that falcon would want to return to the same place. However, it can't, right? It's lost, and that's an important image in Roar's chapter. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. So we cannot find our source. We cannot find that from which we came, and we find that all around us things are descending into chaos. The blood-dimmed tide is loose, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The blood-dimmed tide, first suggestion of real death, and violence in the context of this storm. When faced with such things, and we think here of terrifying cases of, of war and, and organized human violence, what is one of the first things to go? The ceremony of innocence, politeness, kindness, holding doors, caring for others, personal sacrifice. If you're in a context where you're physically threatened all the time, right? Those things will not survive. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So the best maybe had a sense of certainty or moral virtue before feel lost like the falcon in this storm and don't know what to do. While the worst who had perhaps felt alienated from those those uh, moral norms and virtues um, are now charging forth and, and pursuing whatever their own private and specific interest might be. So we have here a picture uh, for Rohr, I would say, and his choice to include this, of the circumstances, we can even say, of our own lives, right? What do things look like before we begin to truly seek that center, before we make changes in our life? Um, that connect us 
with that center. Uh, so this is not only a case of the Christian notion of the end of time, but something related to ourselves. So just a slide or two on each of the three chapters here, and then we'll move on to, to Stoddard. And I hope you are pausing at certain points, because of course I'm, I'm going on quite a bit, but I'm hoping that you'll watch this in appropriate segments. So in chapter one, center and circumference, uh, there's a lot we could pull from that, and I look forward to discussing it with you in the forum. Uh, but let's look at this passage. We are, Rohr writes, a circumference people with little access to the center. We live on the boundaries of our lives in the widening gyre, confusing edges with essence, too quickly claiming the superficial as substance. But the edges of our lives, fully experienced, suffered, and enjoyed, lead us back to the center and the essence. Rohr is really drawing on an old Christian image, really an image that comes before Christianity, of the term is exitus and reditus, but let's keep it in English. Um, uh, exit and return, right? So each of us is born, we are living our lives, we've somehow moved from whatever our source was within the context of this tradition, in this case God, um, outward to a concern with all kinds of practical, call them worldly things, right? And the ultimate goal, the ready to, the return, right, is to find one's way through or past all of these worldly concerns back to rejoin that center, right? So Rohr is using this notion um, and in the spirit of the quotation we had from Alan of Lil, he's saying that these edges, fully experienced, suffered, enjoy, and enjoyed, lead us back to the essence. The goal is not to reject the world. The goal is not to quit your job and move to a cave. Right? The goal is through living better, through living more deeply your everyday life, in that way, to follow the path of that labyrinth and to return to the center, to the source for Roar to God. Another short passage from chapter one. Christians have been worshiping Jesus's journey instead of doing his journey. The first feels very religious. The second just feels human and not glorious at all. So what is it to worship Jesus's journey rather than doing his journey, right? If I worship Jesus's journey, I might learn about his life. I might study the history. I might learn about the teachings and the practices of my religion, whatever it might be. Um, but that doesn't guarantee that I myself will actually live out the same kind of life that Jesus lived, right? That's the danger, is we can get so hooked on the, as it were, externals of our tradition that we miss the essence. We miss doing as, in this case, Jesus did, right? Following the example in our everyday lives. So this is a tension within any tradition, uh, any, any religious tradition, um, and we'll certainly have occasion to talk more about it in the course. In chapter two, just one slide here on chapter two, um, he talks about this, what he calls the vision of enchantment. Okay, so if the first chapter was setting out the problem, this chapter is beginning to sketch the solution, and, and the last chapter we have will continue that. He writes, we're already there. We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already totally in the presence of God. What's absence is awareness. Little do we realize that God is maintaining us in existence with every breath we take. As we take another, it means that God is choosing us now and now and now. We have nothing to attain or even learn. We do, however, need to unlearn some things. This is essential to Rohr's view. He doesn't want to privilege the church, religion, even the teachings of the church, right? All of those can be important means. But the end for him is that reditus, that return, that connection with the source of our being, which for Rohr is described as God. Uh, the thing is that that, that return, that ready to, right, is not something where we have to get on a path and travel a long distance. Um, the, the vision of enchantment is that our everyday lives, everything that we do, all of the interactions and encounters we have with everyone uh, that we meet, 
uh, is uh, the goal. <laughs> there's, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to gain. There's nothing to learn or attain. Right? I'll just touch on chapter 3 and then we'll get into the, the second reading from, from Stoddard. So here uh, he writes a couple of passages uh, that I wanted to, to quote for you. Uh, we have to allow ourselves, he says, to be drawn into sacred space, into liminality. All transformation takes place there. We have to move out of, quote, business as usual and remain on the, quote, threshold, limen in Latin, where we are betwixt and between. There the old world is left behind, but we're not sure of the new one yet. That's a good space, right? a liminal experience. Right? They think about the night before you turn 18, right? or the week before you do, or the night before you are married, for example. These are times when you haven't yet entered a new state, but you are already somehow exited from the old state. Right? It's a time of transition, or as he puts it here, transformation. This, for him, is a productive space to be in because it both reminds us that the things that we take for granted every day, the status quo, are not as simple or straightforward as we think them to be. And it also beckons us to something that's deeper, that's fuller, that's more complete, uh, an understanding that is those things in a way of living. The way things are, he writes, must be somehow interrupted. Uh, continuing in my own voice here, the system must be dis deconstructed. That is the job of the prophet. And he talks a lot about the prophet here in this notion of return to the sacred. Um, the prophet leads us out of normalcy, dismisses it, debunks it. Right? So the figure of the prophet is one about whom we'll have a bit more to say later in the course. The prophet is understood here as someone who speaks for God someone who feels that he or she senses especially injustice, a failure to recognize our interconnectedness and the responsibility that we bear, not only to all people, but to all things, and calls for changes, social changes, uh, reflective of that. Often the voice of the prophet is very marginalized in a social sense, right? Uh, but he or she, for Roar, is one who touches on that center and brings everyone to awareness uh, that reaching that center is, is something very important. Here's a, the last, um, really last one now uh, uh, from chapter three. Um, he's talking here about the practical implications of, of what he's been talking about, right? He says the following, if we hate people who don't agree with us, if we feel righteous and superior to those who have different politics, we're not in the spirit. Until that grace is given to be in the spirit, we should not presume we have a prophetic charism. Charism means here a, a gift. When we have the prophetic charism, we don't inflict pain on them. We hold the pain in ourselves. We absorb the pain. We don't project it or avenge the evil we see. We surrender to the realization that we are also complicit in the evil of the world. It's just a matter of when and where and how. Right? So I feel like this book speaks to our current political moment in an important way. Rohr's provocative and controversial claim is that if you are able to see the world in the way he's been laying out, as consisting of center and circumference, of a, a call to move toward that center uh, by realizing the depth dimension of where we are. If you do that and live, importantly, what he calls a contemplative life, right? a life of contemplation and a practice of, of contemplative prayer, then you will indeed stand up to those uh, who uh, you believe are acting unjustly, um, but you won't place yourself above them in order to inflict pain on them or to feel righteous or superior to them. Um, you will recognize, rather, the interconnectedness of all of us and the extent to which all of us are on that labyrinth, groping our way through and never quite sure where we are. 
All right, so we're pairing Richard Rohr this week with a discussion of Sufi Islam. So if you haven't paused yet, now is a good moment to take a break, get a cup of coffee or tea, whatever your preference is, uh, and we'll get started on this. So our author here, William Stoddart, as we said at the top, is a scholar writing about Islam. He may or may not be a practicing Muslim himself. I, I do not know. What he's concerned with is a distinction between what we can call the exoteric and the esoteric uh, traditions uh, within Islam. So exoteric means on the outside, as we discussed last time in relation to esoteric spiritualities, whereas esoteric means on the inside or the deeper inner meaning of something. In the case of Islam, uh, the Islamic tradition is, is vast and diverse. Within that tradition, there is a, another tradition nested within, uh, and it's known as Sufism. Uh, and we'll get into the reasons for that in a moment. The Sufi tradition is very important to those who practice it. They believe it connects them with the essence or the core of their Muslim faith. For other Muslims, uh, they are suspicious of Sufi Islam, uh, believing that it actually strays from the kind of narrow path of, of the practice of the tradition. Um, so this is one of the debates that you often see within religions. Uh, religion, uh, Stoddart points out, can be outward and formal, uh, but spirituality is typically inward and what he calls supra-formal. So supra means going above. Um, and this, I think, can be related to what Rohr has said about the circumference and center. So in a way, we would say that Rohr's notion of contemplative practice, of you know, seeking out that center, as we've been discussing, is an example of an esoteric tradition within Christianity. I feel like Rohr would probably not accept that characterization of it, but it does claim to get to the essence of what that tradition is about through a more inward path. We need to say a little bit about Islam as a tradition, as I, it may not be familiar to all of us. Um, importantly, uh, the name of the religion is Islam, which means submission to God. Uh, Muslim is the name of, or is the designation for a person who has made that submission and accepted Islam as his or her faith. One becomes a Muslim by reciting three times with conviction the Shahada. There is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. And I will not attempt uh, the pronunciation of the phrase in Arabic, uh, but you have it there on the slide. Uh, there are not sacraments in the same way there are in many Christian traditions. It really has to do with the conviction of the believer and their resolution to live the life of a devout Muslim. Uh, the religion uh, focuses on the recitation uh, given to the Prophet Muhammad over a period of years in the 7th century. Uh, it is believed that these words received by Muhammad uh, were conveyed to him by the archangel Gabriel, the same figure who in the Bible is said to have announced to Mary uh, God's intention that she should be the mother of Jesus Christ. Uh, and these words, uh, over time, uh, were recorded in what we now call the Qur'an. Uh, and, and the Qur'an is understood as the actual speech of God in the Arabic language. So it's not understood only as things Muhammad believed about God or that the early Muslim community expressed, but is, is taken to be the actual words spoken by God to Muhammad. This is why when you see a copy of the Quran, it will not be a translation. It's understood that the words or speech of God cannot be properly speaking translated. It will rather say the meaning of the Holy Quran. That, that is, in English, somebody has you know, written down what the words mean, um, but the book itself is understood to be untranslatable. The Quran, that is, these words received by Muhammad uh, from God, is the center of Islam in the same way that Jesus Christ is the center of Christianity. So when Christians, uh, Christians often refer to Jesus Christ as the Word of God or the Logos, as we have in the first verse of the first chapter of the Gospel of John, 
uh, Muslims see the Quran also as the word of God and indeed the words of God. Uh, Muhammad is the messenger of God who conveyed God's words to the early Muslim community uh, and he's often uh, his name is often followed by the words peace be upon him which you'll see um, in English as PBUH. A really important teaching of Islam is what is called Tawheed or the oneness of God that underlying any various manifestations of God and people talk about the 99 names of God God is ultimately fundamentally profoundly one and this is a way in which early Muslims sought to distinguish their own understanding of God from that of the early Christians who had already begun to speak in terms of God as a trinity and you know this from the sign of the cross in Christianity the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit three persons of one nature a center of Muslim practice or the center today is the city of Mecca located in Saudi Arabia uh, the city of Medina a bit north of that is also very important Muhammad grew up in Mecca he worked as a trader there uh, prior to his revelations and his work forming the early Muslim community what you have on the screen here is an image of the Kaaba this is a place that has been in Mecca since the time of Muhammad you see it draped with the cloth in a reverential way uh, people what are, was called circumambulate the, Kaab, the Kaaba uh, to ambulate means to walk and circum is around so it literally means to walk around um, and this is a key part of the pilgrimage to Mecca that every devout Muslim is called upon to undertake if they are able during their lifetime. It, in fact, this duty of pilgrimage is one of five what are called the pillars or the archon of Islam. The root of that word archon is the same as we have for architecture, uh, so it means the structure of something. The Islamic law or Sharia is characterized by these five pillars. They are prayer, fa uh, faith, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and pilgrimage. I will not read the whole slide for you, but I invite you to pause and, and to have a look at it. This has to do with the exoteric practice of Islam, right? This is the, the way in which a devout Muslim outwardly lives out their faith. Sufism is one tradition within the tradition of Islam that concerns not how you outwardly live out your faith in, in the form of following rules and and the five pillars, um, but in addition to and beyond that, a kind of deep practice of the presence of God. In Arabic, Stoddart writes, Sufism is called tasawuf. This word comes from suf, meaning wool, which is a reference to the woolen war, uh, woolen robe worn by the earliest Sufis. Um, they, they keep, he emphasizes, on this exoteric path of Sharia, the five pillars which we just looked at in addition to much else, uh, but is focused on the esoteric path, the inner truth and the way leading to it. So the truth itself is known as the hakika, and the way leading to it is known as the tarika. Right? Debates about the orthodoxy of Sufism have, have been frequent, uh, as mentioned at the top. Um, some Muslims believe that Sufis are adding to the teaching of Islam in a way they, they do not have a right to do. Stoddart defends Sufism from this charge, but also he insists that Sufism must remain connected to these exoteric traditions and these practices. It can't just swing off and become something totally separate. Sufis teach not only the oneness of God, core Muslim belief, which we've already referred to, Tawheed, they also teach the oneness of all things, Wadat al wujud This refers to not only the unity of God, but the unity of God with all things. This is reminiscent of what Rur says about the you know exit from God and return to God as your source. Right? There is a fundamental unity that is not visible to us now, perhaps, but which will be realized more fully in the future. Will will, will be realized in all its fullness in the future. We should say. 
um, uh, the practice uh, to reach this or to realize this, uh, as Stata puts it, uh, is to deepen one's awareness through devotional practices. And these practices are known as dikr. Now, I encourage you to watch some of the videos that I've put up on e-learning about Sufism. Um, I'm not going to put those in this video, both because it would make it much too long, as if it's not already, uh, but also because of copyright issues. I don't have a right to, to publish those things. Um, however, um, I do want to highlight a couple of um, ideas that Stoddart makes in the text that might not be obvious to you in their meaning. So here we have uh, the distinction between three parts of the human being, uh, and those parts are body, soul, and spirit. I think spirit and soul are often run together. Uh, we're often unsure of the distinction between those two. Uh, the way to think about it is the, the body is the body. Um, the soul is the concern of psychology, and that's how you see here in, in Greek the word is psuche, or it's that root of the word psychology. It has to do with the functioning of our life, both mental and, and physical. Um, neuroses, psychoses, disorders, disease of various kind, right? Uh, the psychology deals with that. Uh, beyond the soul, however, uh, all, both Christianity and Islam affirm the reality of the spirit. Uh, and this refers to the intellect, right? So not only the brain and not only the mind even, but the intellect. That's what happens when you are, for example, engaged in doing some math, right? And then you finally just see the answer, like it comes to you, you realize it. That moment of insight or realization pertains to what these traditions call the intellect. And they understand that it's possible for human beings to live an intellectual life, right? That is to live in a way that's fuller or deeper uh, than, than one often is able to do. Um, the relation of these words to, to Latin um, is, is provided here. Corpus for body, anima for soul. You get our word animation from that. We take a static picture and make it move. You animate it, you give it a soul, right? Um, and spiritus for spirit. And then in Greek, um, you have psyche for soul. So as we said, that's the root, for, root of psychology. Soma for body. We get the word psychosomatic from that. So uh, something that you're thinking in a certain way that causes a physical reaction psychosomatic reaction, and then pneuma, or nous for Greek, meaning intellect. So all of this is detailed, but the important thing to get from this is that there are these three levels of each person, according to these traditions. And what these traditions want to do is to reach all three of these levels, but also to go further. And here we have another table from Stoddard that may not have been clear to you initially. So we have at the bottom here the things that we started with, the body, soul, and spirit. Beyond those things, though, there are two other levels that are, we would say, higher or more general than them. The first is being, lahut, right? God as creator, helper, and judge. Uh, so we have been brought to being, into being, uh, for Christianity and Islam, by God. God is the creator, helper, judge. Um, God has created our spirit, our soul, and our body, uh, and revealed God's self, himself, to us through the scriptures and in other various ways. Um, there is, however, something beyond that appearance, that manifestation of God. We refer to the 99 names of God within Islam, right? Beyond those manifestations of God, there is, this tradition maintains, that which is beyond being. And this is known as the essence of God. Meister Eckhart, an important figure at our college, a Dominican teacher, called this the ground of being, right? Um, this is that aspect of God which cannot be conveyed through symbols, but can only be encountered directly through contemplation or through various devotional practices, dikr, as we saw in the Sufi case. So if conventional religion belongs to row number two here, right? Teachings about God, what God has said, what God has done, level one corresponds to the ultimate level of connection with God, who God really is in God's self, right? 
That is what these traditions are seeking to do, these spiritual traditions of contemplation and Sufism. Here's our last chart and, and also the last slide um, in our presentation. Um, again, something that I expect you may not have understood initially. So here we have a diagram of the relation between man, which would be human beings, regardless of gender, and God. Uh, so man, so-called here, is the created. So God created human beings. Okay. Um, there is, uh, at the kind of lowest level here, the fallen uh, individual man. That is, all of us most of the time, right? It's possible, however, uh, for us to practice truth and virtue and to move up to this higher level, man as prophet or avatara, as, as it's called here. Uh, and av the word avatar comes from that, a representative of God or a messenger of God. So if we live righteously or justly, we can move from our mere fallen individuality to some uh, to uh, an ability to express God. Um, at the top of the chart here, we have this a similar kind of structure. We have being and beyond being, as discussed above. So being, personal God, creator, judge, this is what God has said and done, right? Um, however, uh, there is beyond that, uh, God beyond being, and here he calls this not only the divine essence, but the supra-personal God. So the goal within Sufism, through all of the practices that you'll see in the videos, and as you find described in this text, is to move from our individual fallen state to a level through practice of truth and virtue, where we can convey um, uh, the, the message and the way of living um, that's reflective of God, and in that way to connect not only with a personal God as revealed through these traditions, but to experience that unity with God, uh, not only God's unity in himself, but our unity with him and the unity of all things with him, right? So this, this is a process of, of ascent expressed in the chart here. All right, friends, you've been great. I do hope you've taken a little bit of a break. We've covered a lot of ground, of course, just some thoughts in conclusion. So we have here within Christianity, the tradition of contemplative practice of returning to the center, right? We have here within Islam, the tradition of Sufism, of trying to reach an awareness through our experience of that God beyond God, the God beyond being, right? The essence of God. Both of these traditions have been criticized roundly by other members of Christianity and Islam. Respectively, they're seen as kind of new age or out there. Um, however, they have been uh, influential for many hundreds of years uh, and for many folks um, define the kind of ultimate aims of each of these traditions. So when we're talking about religious spiritualities, we're talking about, yes, engaging in that space of contestation that is the religion or the tradition, right? But also going beyond that into a deeper uh, level of things uh, within ourselves, as it were, and in that way, connecting not just with different manifestations of God or teachings of the religion, but having a profound experience of the presence of God in our everyday lives. So I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion in the forum.